Good morning. We're here again. It is Wednesday morning. Go to church tonight. It'll be good for you. And it'll be good for those you meet there. You need to be with each other. And uh, I tell you what, we finished up 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, which means that we went through the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians and the second epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. First and second Thessalonians, they're done. I asked you to be praying for me. I was either going to do Micah, no, I was either going to do Joel or Zechariah, and I decided to do Joel for a vast number of reasons, and the Lord gave me peace about that. And so early yesterday morning, I've been, oh, I've been reading Joel and, Joel and Zechariah for weeks. You know? I preach a lot, about, a lot out of both of them. It's, it's real easy to preach out of Joel because Peter preaches out of Joel on the day of Pentecost. Uh, he quotes extensively in two of his sermons from Joel chapter 2. And just to refresh your memory, verse 28 says, uh, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon all the servants, upon the handmaids in those days, will I pour out my spirit. Another verse that's important to me is describing the gathering of all the armies on earth under the Antichrist to resist the coming of Jesus and his armies from heaven to fight against Christ at his second coming. And uh, this is in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Jezreel, where the blood will flow as high as the horse's bridles. In verse 14, Billy Graham used this verse to name his television program, The Hour of Decision. Billy Graham felt like he was called into the ministry as an evangelist to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ unto repentance and salvation to every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. His call to the preaching ministry came from Joel chapter 3 verse 14 multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the hour of the Lord is near for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision in a spiritual sense, the day of the Lord is near now for all of us because you don't know when you're going to go to meet him. You don't know when you're going to die. I've lived 69 years and my flesh says, well, things will just keep on going. Well, 70 years. And, and I, my flesh will just say that things will keep on going like they are, but one day they won't. And I too will die if the Lord doesn't come for me first in the rapture. So this is a very important book to me. I just like to talk a little bit about Joel. He's we don't know a lot about him. By the, the by the, the people he's prophesying about and too, we know he was after Jehoshaphat. We know he was before Uzziah. Because of the uh, uh, partly because of the enemies, the structure of the people that he was talking to and the enemies he was talking about. Edom, the Philistines, Tyre and Sidon. You see, 
those were the, the basic enemies in those days. But see, in the, in the days of Jehoshaphat, the king that uh, he calls the Valley of Jezreel, Joel does it, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, it came, became associated with him in, in a campaign against the Syrian army. The big enemy of Israel were the Syrians. Joel was probably a very young prophet when Elijah was a very old prophet. Maybe we can be fairly certain that Joel was a contemporary of Elisha, Elijah's successor in the northern kingdom of Israel. But Joel was a prophet to Judah, the southern kingdom. Again, the primary enemies that Joel talks about are Edom, Philistia, the Philistines, the Tyre, and Sidon, Egypt. Edom, which would include at that time, you know, Idumea, some other places like that. If we come to a, a, a later date, like during the time of Isaiah, well, Isaiah, uh, Micah, they were prophets to Judah at that time. Amos was a prophet to Israel during that time. The big enemies were the Assyrians and the Egyptians. Not Edom and Philistines and Tyre and Sidon. And if you come even to a later dating of like during the days of Jeremiah, well, Jeremiah was, it was, it was and Ezekiel were the prophets of the captivity. Jeremiah from Jerusalem and Judah during the fall and captivity of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem and Ezekiel in Babylon at the same time. They were the prophets of the Babylonian campaign. So the Assyrians aren't even mentioned. And these other eras had their own enemies and their own prophets. Even if you try to date it during the return, uh, Israel had no enemies at that time except for the except for the Arab tribes in the land that were trying to keep them from building in the book of, of Nehemiah. Israel was at peace because of the commandment of the king of Persia, which had, had taken over Babel. And Haggai and Zechariah were their prophets. So we must put Joel in or near the reign of Joash, which would be somewhere between, say, 835, 840 B.C. and 890, 795 to 800 B.C. See, Jehoshaphat had a son. And his son had a son. His name was Jehoram. He had a son named Jehoram. Jehoshaphat did, and Jehoram had a son named Ahaziah. Ahaziah was king when Jehu killed the last of Ahab's men and, 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 and killed wicked Queen Jezebel in Israel. At that same time during the Jehu Wars in northern Israel, Judah's king was Ahaziah. 
and then this would have been around 840. 850 BC. And Ahaziah was confederate with the king of Israel. And he went to see him, went to visit him. Jehu and his men killed Ahaziah while he was visiting the king of Israel. His mother's name was Athaliah, and in Jerusalem she caused that all the king's sons be killed. See, you know, Israel and Samaria, that they weren't the only places that had a wicked woman that wanted to be queen and run everything. Well, Jezebel was dead now. They said, throw down Jezebel. And they said, we ain't going to throw her down. And they said, throw down Jezebel. So they throwed her down. And she smashed and was bursted and parted asunder. And of the fragments that remained of her, they gathered up 12 baskets full. Well, maybe not. Maybe I'm getting my Bible a little mixed up there, but. Jezebel is dead, but Athaliah is alive and well and killing all her son's children. Because she's saying, if my son can't reign, then I'm going to reign. And she killed them all except for one. His name was Joash. And Athaliah had a sister. Her name was Jehoshua. And she went and she took little Joash, the baby, and she hid him for seven years. She was married to, uh, oh, what was his name? She was married to the priest. And his name, sorry about that, I don't know what happened. She was married to the priest, and his name was... Jehoiada, I don't know how I forgot that. He was the he was the priest. He was the high priest. And uh so what he did was they hid him for seven years. Well six years, and then when he was seven. But his 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 uh, his grandma, Athaliah, she was running the land. She thought she'd get killed all the king's children so that she could be in charge. Then Jehoiada and Jehoshua, his wife, who was had been sister to King Ahaziah, they proclaimed Joash king, and they killed that wicked Athaliah, murdered her, and so peace came to Israel. Jo Joash was a godly king. As long as Jehoiada was alive, and he kind of turned away from him when Jehoiada was dead. But it was during this time, roughly somewhere between 840 B.C. and 800 B.C., that Joel wrote his work. Because Judah was at peace, the Assyrians had not yet risen. They were the only people that they were fighting during Joash's day were the ones mentioned in the book of Joel. Edom, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. And we're not even clear whether that was a military or a political conflict at the time with Pharaoh. So that's what we know about Joel from deduction, from timing, from internal evidence. One thing we know for sure about him is the one thing we know for absolutely for sure about Joel is in the first verse. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Who is Bethuel? Now, who is Bethuel, you might ask? Bethuel. Bethuel. 
It sounds like a bullet ricocheting. With you. With you. With you. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. I don't know who he was. The Bible doesn't say, say who he was. We don't have a genealogy for Joel. Was he, was he a priest? Probably not. Because it doesn't say the word of the Lord came to Joel the priest. Remember Ezekiel was a priest? Jeremiah, he was among the priests at Anathoth. But Amos, he wasn't a priest. He was a herdsman. He was following along. Isaiah was from the school of the prophets. He was a prophet. As a matter of fact, he was the prophet to the king. That was the official office. It was actually established by Samuel. He was prophet to the king. In chapter 1 of Joel, we will kind of wade in here slowly. And I will tell you ahead of time that, like many Old Testament prophets, Joel writes with an ear fulfillment and a far future fulfillment in mind. Because he talks about things that were happening then, but when you take in the entire aspect of what he is talking about, these things have not happened yet, so they're yet future. Another thing important about Joel, and he may have been the second or third prophet to write, maybe the second prophet to write in Judah. Obadiah may be the first Jonah may be the second, but his pro he, he lived in, in Israel and his prophecy was to Nineveh in Assyria. So I believe that, that Joel chronologically is before Jonah because Judah was not having any threat from Assyria at the time that this was written. The threats were coming from, again, Egypt, Edom, Tyre, Sidon, Philistia, the Philistines. He wasn't probably the first, but he was maybe the second, possibly the second writing prophet in the Old Testament. Before Isaiah, before Jeremiah, before Daniel, way before Daniel. 300 years before Daniel. Uh, he sees the first coming of Jesus. He sees the outpouring of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. He sees a yet future time, the last days, the latter times, when all the armies of the world will be gathered and that Christ, the, the Son of God, the, will judge them in the valley of Jehoshaphat which is the valley of Je Jezreel which is before the plain of Megiddo so we have <coughs> a far looking overview of all of eschatology all of the things that are yet to happen the rapture the second coming the Battle of Armageddon, the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth, written uh, nearly 900 years, 900, 850 years before the birth of Christ. So that's pretty cool. He had a long view and he had a short view that centered around a pestilence, of a, a plague of locusts you know, bearing shapes and sizes and forms and which we'll get into as we go along no need to overburden you with a bunch of uh, what is the word for the study of insects I don't remember it has its own word um, we don't need to get bogged down in bug anatomy you know or bogged down or bugged down but we will talk about these things as we go, and I will explain them as best I can from the study. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Joel, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, 
the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men. And he's saying, listen up. Hear this, ye old men. And give ear, all inhabitants of the land. You who are old enough to remember, listen up. And if you can remember, then help me to convince everybody else. The spiritual, you know, that's with us still today. Things are happening now that have never happened before. Yet the world, and Satan wants the world to think that we're just going along and everything is happening the same as it's always been. In First Peter, they say, where... Second Peter, where is the promise of his coming? All things remain the same. <laughs> yeah, they just don't know, man. People who don't know up from down are trying to tell you what's what. People who don't know whether they're a man or a woman are trying to tell you what's what. Sodomites are trying to tell you what's what. Sexual perverts of all persuasions are trying to tell you what's what. Child killers, baby murderers are trying to tell you what's what. You know, Isaiah said that the worst case you can be in, your worst punishment, your worst judgment of God upon a nation, is that children are your oppressors and women rule over you. That's the worst case that a country can be in. And we're there, baby. We're there. It says, knowing this first, well, chapter 3, verse 1, Second Peter, this second epistle, beloved, now I write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But see, the old men remember. I remember the United States and all its pride and glory. I saw it as a little boy. I saw it. Now, it was gone before I became to the age of reckoning, really. It was, it was killed on the streets of Dallas on November 22, 1963. And it's been Katie barred the door since then. We killed our king. I know that that's not the way people look at it, but that's what we did. You know, a guy in an undershirt with fried chicken grease under his fingers did not kill President Kennedy. There were three riflemen. It was a conspiracy. And nor was it just a conspiracy. It was a coup d'etat. The corporate powers and the military-industrial complex decided that Kennedy was bad for business and they killed him and put Johnson in. Who would do what they said? And they allowed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act so that Johnson would keep the ammunition and the armaments rolling. And that's why we're always at war somewhere. The last person who tried to stop it was President Kennedy, and they killed him. Let me put it this way. The last person who tried to stop the military-industrial complex, who had the opportunity 
and the position and the authority to do it was Jack and Bobby Kennedy. They blew both their brains out. Think about it, baby. Think about it. So, we old men, we remember. We remember what it used to be, and we remember how it ain't now. I wrote a song called I Know Exactly Where I'm Not. Been an old song. It's a love song about a guy returning to his own neighborhood where he used to live with his wife. But, no, no, I, I know where I'm not. I'm not in the United States. I'm not in a free country. I'm not in the land of the free or the home of the brave. Because children are our oppressors and women rule over us. It is the end of all civilization. It is the end of the world for everything good and darkness is coming. You know, Vietnam was the great twilight. Well, what could follow twilight but darkness? And we're there now. Well, how can you know that, Brother Harris? Because I remember. I remember what we were and I remember what we are and I see what we are now. I remember the pride and glory and now I see the, the shame and the debauchery. So I know. And that's what, what Joel is asking the men to do, the old men, ye old men. Because see, the old men are the ones who remember. They know that it's different now. They know that things are, aren't the same. They know things will never be the same again because of the people who are in charge. <laughs> I mean, the people who are running us, you know, and in control of us, if you watch them on TV, they can't even control their own speech, their own walks, their own lives. It's madness. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, verse 2, hear this, ye old men. And give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Has it ever been like this? The answer is no. Have women ever ruled over a country and told us that masculinity is bad and all the wit wickedness in the world is caused by testosterone, specifically in white men? Look, I grew up on the north side of Houston. There ain't a prejudice bone in my body. 1930 Chamberlain Street at that time was five blocks west of the barrio. Five blocks north of the ghetto. That's how it was. Most of my friends were some shade of brown. It never bothered me a bit. It never has bothered me. There's nothing racial about it. But I just don't understand how all of a sudden everything could be the fault of just one specific party like it's not. You know, young people can't be at fault. And, uh, people of color can't be at fault. And refugees can't be at fault. Women can't be at fault. So I guess it just leaves people like me. I don't think that anything can be done about it. I don't want to do anything about it. All I want to do is say, remember. Remember how it was and look at how it is now. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? No. I remember when the Houston School District was integrated and there were some Quasi riots in Sam Houston High School, and we shut down for a couple of days. And then we came back, and we had like student uh, 
you know, we called them rap sessions, you know, where black students and white students got together. Now, I was all for the integration because all of a sudden our football team was a contender because we got all these fast black guys from Smiley High School and some other places, and they came to our school. And now they were on our football team. And it wasn't an all-white all, all, an all white, lily white football team. Well, we had some we had some muscle and we had some speed, man. We were a better football team. We were a better basketball team because of integration. I know that those are silly things to worry about. But you know, when you're sitting there, I mean I played on a freshman team that didn't win a game all year. We had a party because we made one touchdown in the last game. <laughs> That's all true. You can ask the quarterback of that team who became a very good player. And he told me at a reunion, I said, I was introducing him to my wife. I said, this is Larry. And honey, he was the best player on our team. He's a real football player. And Larry just said, well, we just didn't have enough guys, James. <laughs> and that was true. We didn't in those days. But the point is, is I remember a time that when the racial unrest, that there were level heads on all sides. And I remember my daddy. And my daddy was a contractor. And he knew some black contractors who had kids in our school now. And he got with them. And he and another a black guy, I believe he was a plumbing contractor. And uh, and and they got together with the, in adult forums and said, hey, if we can work together, if we can do business together, then our kids can go to school together. And that's the way that's the way they dealt with it. That's the way they took it on. Said, we're all here together. We're all here in the same place. Let's get along. And that was the grown ups talking. I don't hear grown-ups talking like that anymore. All I hear is grievance and griping and whining and, uh, you know, I just don't understand it anymore. That's why you ask the old men. I'm not saying I understand everything that's going on. I'm not saying I understand everything that has gone on, but I know things are different. And talk about church. You know, there was a time you could go to church and almost never see a guy in a dress. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but in some churches you can, you know, not, not in any church that I would go to uh, or preach in. And I, you know what? I take it back because I've preached in places that were very liberal and they were, they were gracious to me and let me have my say. They may not have agreed with me, but they sat there and heard it. And so I... I'm grateful that they invited me to come. The big church up, up next to the University of Missouri, very liberal church because most of the most of the big givers and prominent members there are, you know, members of the faculty and staff at the University of Missouri. And so they're all liberal. Very liberal. And um they talk the same way I talked to you. And when I would talk about abortion being murder and that and that we're sacrificing our children not only to the abortuary but uh, but to drugs and alcohol and sexual perversion and everything else in the world see there's more than one way to sacrifice your children to idols and it's uh, you don't have to kill them to do that all you have to do is turn them loose in this society the society will sacrifice them for you you don't have to do it I think your kids don't give them to somebody else to raise. That's crazy. If I had it to do over again, my kids would never set foot in a public school. Wicked. Now, we know it's different now in churches. Like when I was a kid, I got saved when I was going to the New York Baptist Church on Little York Street, naturally. Little York Road, Little York Street, Little York Road. Can't remember. Uh, I you know, growing up poor, I, I didn't know the difference between a road and a street. 
Uh, this road, and there were many people that went to that church, but it wasn't a very large church, neighborhood church, it wasn't some kind of big, you know, cathedral deal or something. I remember how they dressed, and I remember how everybody sat down and shut up. There wasn't no such thing as children church. You brought your kids in there, and you set them down. The parents set them down beside them, and if they acted up, they'd get the tar wheeled out of them. They're going to sit there and listen no matter what. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying it's different. Good morning, Caleb. God loves you. I know that he will bless your efforts today. I, uh, but, uh, so it was different then. Um, uh, I was right at the beginning of the Jesus Revolution, 67. It was trickling out of San Francisco in the Bay Area, in Oakland, Berkeley. It was trickling out, and it came to Los Angeles, of course, around 69 or 70. But there were strains of it that had also migrated to Houston. And I got saved right at the beginning of that. And our music did not change in the church, but it changed in our youth group. Because, see, I got saved when I was 12. So... Uh, in the summer, so when the fall came, I was in the youth group because I was in the seventh grade, the middle, you know, junior high kids, the teenagers. And we started singing the, the, the more folky rock type music that was coming out of California in the Calvary chapels. You know, life was filled with guns and wars. Everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. You know, left behind. You've been left behind. It was different. And things changed. People were serious about Bible study. I took my Bible to school all the way through high school. Really, Half the kids I knew took their Bibles to school. And they read them. There was a Bible club. Was it overcrowded? No. Just like church, it was never overcrowded. I'm just saying it was different. And in that Bible club, we had white students and black students and brown students, Orientals. We even had some Native Americans whom daddy insisted were all Comanches. But he, I have no proof of that. Or as my grandfather would say, dirt-eating Comanches. Now, they were not too fond <coughs> of Comanches out on the Llano Escondado. Um, but we were all there together. And we talked about Jesus. I remember having a young man, I can't remember his name, but he was a senior when I was a... He was a senior in high school when I was a junior, uh, when I was a sophomore, so he was two years ahead of me. And he had frizzy, curly hair, kind of like mine. But back then, we all combed it, you know, over our foreheads like a surfer kind of deal, you know. But his was always just sticking out like an afro. Wish I could remember his name. He married a girl named Courtney. Anyway, he was like that guy in in that movie, uh, Thief in the Night, about the rapture, that first really good rapture movie. That came out in 1972, I think. You know, where Patty, little Patty Dunning, she gets 
caught up in the, she doesn't go in the rapture, but her grandma does, and so they have to live through the tribulation. It was a scary movie, but he looked like the guy, it looked like the guy from Teen Town at the fair. You know, there was a little Christian outreach, and he was always preaching to his friends, and when the rapture came, he was mowing his lawn, and then when the rapture hit, he was gone, and the lawnmower was just sitting there running and push mowing. We had a guy like that leading our Bible study. We read books. I read The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I read uh, books by, by uh, J. Dwight Pentecost. I read books by J. Vernon McGee. I, I listened to Brother Roloff every night on the KPRC radio. There wasn't any religious channels back then. Religious broadcasting, they bought syndicated time on commercial radio stations. You heard a variety of things. I don't believe you can even have a Bible club today. Well, they say you can, but you got to fight to have it. And then they got somebody spying on you all the time to see what you're saying. It's hard to have church today because you'll get report somebody come in and report you in the paper that you said something that they didn't like. I say stuff they don't like on this program every morning. It's only by the grace of God that I haven't been shut down. The point I'm trying to make is from chapter one of Joel, verse two is that you who are of a certain age remember how it was before it changed. And now things are changing over and over and over and over at such a rapid pace that by the, you can't even get used to one change before there's another change. <laughs> I was talking to a man the other day who committed a crime, so let's just say 40 years ago, before the internet, and, you know, I like these crimes that we committed before everybody could record it on their Facebook, right? Be glad you did all your stupid stuff before cell phones, uh, or smartphones, rather. But he said that his case was adjudicated. He, he did probation, and, uh, and in his sentence was, uh, was down in Texas, you know, his sentence was suspended or well they said it he was probated he was on probation when he served the probation time well then it wasn't held against him they took it off his record well then they came back later and changed the law and decided that it goes back on the record and so now every time you know for the last 30 years or so every time he goes to apply for a job or a loan or something he's got to say uh, that he's a convicted felon, even though uh, whether it was a felony or not was questionable, and he did two or three years of probation to serve his time. But laws change. Your teacher, your teacher had a DWB when and when he was twenty two years old. That's driving while blasted. <laughs> Not recommended. And uh, they threw me in the pokey, and my producer came and bailed me out of jail and got me to the recording session. And the, and, uh, the guy that owned the studio looked at me and he said, Hey, Jimmy, what kind of bird don't fly? I, went, I don't know. Of course, I've been up all night and, and uh, out of cigarettes for a long time and desperately hung over. The worst thing in the world is to sober up while you're awake. It just kind of wears off a little at a time. Uh, and he says, uh, so what kind of bird don't fly? And I said, I don't know. He said, a jailbird. And I'm thinking, oh, cute, really cute. But you know what? You know, I, I had two or three cop cars chasing me. I had, uh, you know, I finally ran off the road. And they out into the out into the on the side of the road on the freeway, the Gulf Freeway of all things, Houston, Texas. Oh, they hauled me in. Somebody drove my car in. 
I probably had five thousand dollars worth of guitar in the back and fiddle, you know, in the back seat. They locked everything up. They let me take my fiddle inside. So it was afraid it'd melt. And they said, well, we don't usually do that, but we'll keep it for you because they knew who I was. I suspect they followed me out of the bar where I was playing. And uh, some guy told me, hey, he said, if you play us Orange Blossom Special, we'll, we'll just let you sleep it off and go home. Well, I got up on the desk and played Orange Blossom Special dancing around on top of the desk in that squad room. And them bastards didn't let me go. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I deserved it. I deserved to be in jail. I deserved to be thrown under the jail. But my punishment was a $400 fine in a year of probation where I didn't have to do anything except except make a phone call into the probation office from wherever I was once a month. Now, it scared me enough to never get behind the wheel drunk again, or even if I was drinking. Nowadays, gosh, they, they put you in prison for years, and they probably should. I'm just pointing out how things are different. you got to be old to remember things like that. You have to be old to remember happy hour. Because that was before they got tough on drunk drivers. You know, the happy hour started about 5 o'clock when people got off work. And you could get two drinks for the price of one, sometimes three. And then fancy bars, they would have a buffet set up where you could, you know, for the price of one drink, you could have two drinks and eat supper off of the hors d'oeuvre table. It might have just been cheese and crackers or a little bit of sliced lunch meat, but... Uh, Whatever it was, you could get full for a couple of bucks and two drinks, you know. Don't have that anymore. I'm not saying any of these things are right or wrong. I'm just saying that you have to have a certain amount of time under your belt to see how radically things have changed. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Like, is the stuff going on now? Is it like it was? Is it like you've ever seen it before? So, we got the first couple of verses in. And we're going to be in Joel for a long time because he gives over 800 years before the birth of Christ he gives an overview of biblical prophecy from the rapture all the way through the great tribulation and into the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth and he does this about 850 years before Jesus, the man Jesus, the Son of God, was born in Bethlehem. Born, born, born in Bethlehem. Hello, Margaret. You got here just as I was leaving, but I've talked, I don't know how long, but it's been a long time. But we got the background on Joel established. It's uh, He's one of the minor prophets. He's right after Hosea. Hosea, Joel, Amos, I think. Yes, Hosea, Joel, Amos. So Hosea is right after Daniel, and then Joel is right after Hosea. We got through the first and the second verses, and uh, we will be here a while. I love you all. Um, I'm not going to spend another 20 minutes tomorrow talking about how things used to be. All I'm doing is pointing out that if you have any age on you at all, you know things are not now as they were. And it's those differences that we're going to get into because it's going to be very important when we talk about the the whole middle of this chapter, first chapter of Joel. I hope you enjoy, Joel. I always have, like I say, it is very integral to New Testament preaching, and we find strains of it not only in Peter, 
but also in Paul in their sermons. And so this is a this is a very important book because it, it gives good overviews of things that are becoming more more important to us every day. God bless you.